we do actually though. Um, for homework, I asked everyone to make sure they had PyCharm mm -hmm. set up on their computer. I just wanted uh, to take a quick moment to ask if anyone had any issues getting PyCharm running. Um, and also for those of you who have it installed, please open it up now because it, it does take a little bit of time to get started. All right, so Derek, I'm glad you downloaded it. Did it install? Did anyone have any issues installing it? Um, or is everything okay? All right, um, I'm going to share my screen. And so for the first part of today's class, I want to just make sure everyone's familiar with at least the basic um, tools of PyCharm. So PyCharm is, like I said, an IDE. It basically packages a whole bunch of tools for you to use as a developer, as a programmer. and it has all these tools to make your life easy, but PyCharm has a ton of tools and a lot of them we actually don't even need. So it can be intimidating um, the first time. So if you open up PyCharm, um, you might have a screen that kind of looks like this. Um, you might have like a full screen version as well. That's perfectly fine. Um, but if your screen looks like this, um, you want to click new project. And the way PyCharm works is that everything that you write is organized into what's called projects. And a project essentially is just a folder that all your files will live in. It's just a way of organizing things. So if you're opening it for the first time, you wanna make a new project. You have a couple options. You can leave pretty much everything to the defaults. Um, the main one is where you want the fi project files to be located. So here, there's some default place. I'm going to leave it uh, here for now. But you can change the last part, which is what it's going to be called, essentially. So maybe I want to call this um, AOE Python 2. Um, and I'm just called winter. Um, there's a drop down, and there's some options here. But you don't can leave that completely uh, as it is. The defaults are. Great. So when you cl click create, you'll get this now like full screen window. And there's uh, some loading involved that PyCharm has to do to set up everything for you. And again, this is the benefit and a little bit the downside of using an IDE. It's doing all this to make your life easier, but it takes time to set up. Um, so while I'm waiting for this to run, did everyone else uh, successfully have create a, uh, a new project? Or alternatively, does anyone have any issues creating a project, getting a window that kind of looks like this? So Derek, I see your thumbs up. Charlie, Evan, Jarrett, do you guys have any issues? No? All right. OK, so the main thing that we want to do uh, is really just get into writing Python. And so to understand how everything is set up, on the left is kind of your project explorer. It tells you what all the files are and where they're located within this project. So at the very top, you see this folder icon. That's your project. So everything in your project goes in here. And you can open it up, and you see another folder inside, VENV. -E you don't have to worry about that. It's this yellow color. It's something that uh, it's important. I might talk about what it is later. But for now, you can just ignore it. To create our Python file, what we want to do is right click on the project folder. And sometimes the right click can take a little bit to pop up. But then you get a whole bunch of options. And the first one is new. And we go to new Python file. Right? So when we click that, a window pops up for what we want to call it. And so here, uh, I'm just going to call mine class 8, because today is our eighth class. And now the main part of our screen 
uh, has changed. And this is where our Python file is. And at this point, this is similar to what we kind of what I kind of showed yesterday when we're just like using a text file to write Python. But this time we're doing it inside the IDE. Uh, but the, the idea is the very same. Here now we can write whatever Python code we want. So again, I'm just going to do the classic hello world. And you notice kind of one nice thing about the IDE is that it has the nice syntax highlighting, just like Google Colab had. Um, like there's a kind of bluish purple for the function. The strings are green. And we're going to see other colors uh, later on. But this is my Python file. Uh, you can see it's called class 8.py. That means that's what I call, uh, that's what I put in the menu at the beginning. And now I want to run this file, right? And so there's a couple of ways of doing it. Uh, but probably the easiest right now is to right click and kind of in the middle of your menu, there's the play button and it says run class 8. And if I do, it can take a few seconds, but a window pops up at the bottom, and this is called our terminal or our output window. And you can see right here, it prints out hello world. Unfortunately, this window, I, or I, I can zoom in a little bit, so I can make it a little bit bigger. And you can see that's the output of our file. Um, yeah, so uh, as someone has drawn on my screen, I'm not sure. Once you run a file for the first time, so after we do this right click run option, then at the top right for all the future runs, we can hit the play button up here and it does the same thing. Um, but the first time you run a file, you have to, the, this play button isn't gonna be there. So uh, if you are looking for this play button and you can't find it, uh, you can always right click and run. This is always gonna be here as an option. Um, this is also useful to control which uh, file you want to run. Because for example, if I have multiple files, so I'm going to create another file and call second. And maybe, oops, I put it in the wrong place. So you can see it looks a little bit weird right now. If you look in the explorer, second.py is inside this VNV file, which we don't want. Uh, we want it where class eight is. And so we can just click and drag um, out of the folder. And I'll ask you, do you want to move it? I hit OK. And now everything is back to normal. It's located in the same spot. But here is second pi. Maybe I want um, another print statement just to make it easy. So I can say print um, by, right? And so, this is just something you have to watch out for. If you try to hit the play button, you'll notice it doesn't print out by, right? And that's because if you look next to it, it tells you what it's trying to run. Here it's running class eight. It's not running this second file that I've created. And so to change it, you can look here, but again, it doesn't show up. So to make it show up, you right click run. And now you can see the output says by. After you do that first time, the right click run, now it shows up as an option. So I can either run class eight or I can run second. And I can just choose right here and then hit play and it'll run whichever one I want. Right. So that's the basics of PyCharm creating Python files, writing code, and then running it. And the output just shows up below. So does anyone have any questions? so far, uh, having any issues getting PyCharm to run, creating any of these simple Python files. No from Derek. Evan, Jarrett, Charlie, uh, Jarrett, no. Charlie, no. How about you, Evan? 
Did you get it working? Don't see a response. Um, I just want to make a note that, again, these Python files are pretty much the exact same thing as the notebooks that we've been working with before now. Um, the only difference is that the notebook is separated into the different cells, and you can run one cell and then you run another cell and then you run another cell. Um, that's a, what a notebook is like. But Python files instead is you basically put everything into a single cell, right? You run everything. And other than that, there's no real difference to what we've been uh, doing before. So uh, before I get into like the new stuff for today's class, I want to just write some Python code to refresh what we've been talking about. Um, I'm just going to pick one of the files that I've been working with. So I'm going to get rid of the print hello world and let me define some functions. So like def um, factorial function. And this is going to be kind of a tricky one. I'm going to do the recursive the definition of the factorial, uh, which we talked about before. So the factorial is like you take a number and you multiply it by all the numbers less than it uh, until you reach one. Um, but you can also define it as the factorial of a number is just that number times factorial one less than it. So you can just say return n times factorial n minus one. But this by itself would be an infinite kind of loop because it would just keep calling itself over and over and over again. So you have to add a condition at the beginning. Um, if n is, let's say, less than or equal to 1, we want to return 1. Else, we want to return this other thing. Right. You'll notice here that, again, we have this nice uh, coloring, the syntax highlighting. And the keywords are in this orange color, the name of the function turns into this yellowish color. And you'll also notice these squiggly lines. So PyCharm helps you identify errors and warnings before you even run the code. So here, I have this kind of um, yellow squiggly under the one. And if you put, click your mouse there and hover over the one, you'll notice it gives you a message. And so this, uh, yellow underlines mean kind of warnings, um, or they're just like style notes. So, hey, the way that you wrote this, maybe it's not how we want it to look, how the standards are, but it's not like it's going to cause a problem if you try to run it. So it works completely fine, but it doesn't maybe look right. And so here it's saying it's missing white space, and it lists this PEP8, which is just like a standard that people follow. And basically, the standard says you want a space after your operators. So um, it wants a space. And if you put the space, the squiggly goes away. I believe also, if the squiggly is there and you click the message, this there's a couple options of how to fix it. You can also click this um, light bulb uh, icon. The light bulb gives you a couple options of how to fix this warning. And so the first one's just reformat the file, which puts the space there for you. So that's a function. And we can start, um, I don't know, just calling it. So print factorial, um, let's say 5. And if we notice for a sec, this, again, yellow underlines. And it says it wants a blank line or two blank lines. So again, we can reformat the file. And the squigglies go away. And we can run the file. So I have to make sure I'm running the right one. So I want to run class eight and I hit play. And we see it's 120, which is the correct answer. So again, uh, we have functions like this. Classes, um, not going to worry about it for now. But all the classes that we wrote in the previous classes, uh, you can just like copy paste it into here and it will work perfectly fine. 
Um, I might actually do that a little bit later. But now I think we're ready to get into the new topic for today's class. And that topic is something called packages and modules in Python. And so as I've been talking about, um, kind of an overarching idea of Python 2 is the idea of organizing your code, right? So Python 1 was really about what is Python? How do you write commands? What are the tools available for you? Like the data structures, the if statements, the loops, things like that. Python 2 is more about organization, putting things into functions, putting functions into classes. And now the final step is putting all of that into packages and modules. So it's like kind of a, a bigger layer to things. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is what is a Python module. And that's actually a very simple idea. Any Python file is a Python module. So you can almost think of it as a Python module is just a Python file. They're one and the same, right? Um, anything that's .py is a module. Any module will have .py. So for example, these files that I've created, I've been calling them Python files, but they're also Python modules. And what's interesting about modules is that if you know what the word module means, it, it basically means that they're kind of these individual building blocks they can put together uh, to make something bigger and better. And that's exactly what Python modules allow us to do. What you can do is you can write code, put it into a file, put it into a module. And then in a separate file, you can call that code. You can bring that code in and then use it. So you don't have to write the code multiple times. For example, I have this factorial function in this uh, file. Maybe there's a couple different applications where the factorial function is very useful, and I want to have it available in a lot of different places. Um, they might be completely different use cases, so they're not going to be in the same file. I want separate files for the different uses, but I want this shared function within the both of them. I want this one single factorial function in two separate files. And the way I can do this is here I've put the function in a module, and we're going to do something called importing the module in the separate files. And again, what is the advantage of this? Well, I mean, you might think we can just, again, copy paste the code, right? If we would just want this function in two separate places, just write the function in those two separate places. But as we've been talking about, Copy pasting is never a good idea in programming. One big reason is it makes your code look, uh, uh, makes your code a lot harder to read because you might have a whole huge amount of code that's reused in multiple places and it's not really important, but you need it there. Again, another option is, uh, another downside is that if you want to make changes, right? Maybe you want to upgrade your code or change a variable name, anything like that. Well, if you want to change one version, then if you use copy paste, you have to change all of the versions, right? You have to go to every single place that you put it, you have to change every single version. And if you miss one, it, it could break everything, right? And so what we want instead is kind of one version that's shared everywhere. And so you can just change that one version and it automatically updates wherever you're using it. So to see this in action, um, we're going to use the two files that I've created. So the first one is this class 8.py. The second one is the second.py. You, your files might be called something else. It doesn't really matter what they're called. But uh, again, I have the factorial function inside this file. I'm going to go to the other one. And I'm going to show you guys how to import modules. So to import modules, we have a keyword, and you might guess the keyword. It's called import. So import takes a, a module name. And a module name is basically whatever is in front of the .py extension. So this thing is called class8.py. The module name is class8. Right? We just chop off the .py. 
So what do we want to import? We want to import class eight done, right? And so um, we get this warning, and this warning is basically saying, hey, you imported this module, but you're not like using it at all. So there's no point of importing it. And so that's a warning that we're going to kind of address later on. So we can ignore it for now. Um, notice that this gray coloring is also another way of telling you, hey, you've imported this thing, but you're not actually using it. And so how do we use it after we import it, right? So importing a module is almost like taking that file, taking everything inside of it, and then pasting it into this one. Um, it's a little bit different, and we'll see the differences. But you can almost think of it like that. Once you import a module, you get access to everything that was in there. And so if we want to access this factorial function, for example, we can do that. And the way we do it, and I'll explain why later, you want to type the module name. So it's class 8 again. And you want to hit a dot. And then um, it gives you a couple options. The first one's actually what we want, the factorial function. Um, and we can do five again, or maybe let's do uh, six to be a little bit different. And we can print the result again. So again, this is the import statement. And this is kind of using the import statement. And you'll notice the import statement is no longer grayed out. And that's just because we're actually taking advantage of it. Instead of just importing it and nothing else, we're actually you know, using it. And if I run this file, make sure I'm running the right one, you'll see something interesting. So uh, factorial 6 is 720. So that's why the 720 is here. But the 120 is also here. All right. And this brings us to two things I want to talk about. Well, the first is why is the 120 here? Right. And the way we can think of why 120 shows up is kind of based on what I said before. When you import a module, it's almost as if you're copying everything in that file and then pasting it in. So it's almost the same thing as taking all of this, copying it, and then pasting it like right here. And if you notice, inside this file, we're calling factorial 5 and printing it out. So when you import the module, it also carries over this line right here. Right. So the import doesn't just import functions. It doesn't just import classes. It imports everything. And so it imports statements like this. And so that's why the 120 shows up. Right. Um, if I get rid of this and only have the import statement and run the file, you'll see that it still prints out 120. That's because it imports. And the import, this statement, is causing the 120 to print out. And if I bring everything back, let me fix my formatting to make it neat. The second thing I want to talk about is why we need this class eight. Right. So why can't we just say factorial six? Well, we, we imported the function. The function is called factorial. Why can't we just say factorial six? Why do we have to have class eight dot factorial six? And there's a good reason for this, actually. Um, does anyone want to guess why this would be useful at all? Like to have to write this extra code, class A dot factorial. The idea comes from uh, the fact that. When you're importing modules, in this case, we have the advantage of we're the author of both of these files, right? We know exactly what's going on. Um, but we'll see that the power of packages and modules is that you can create a module, you can create a package, and then you can send it out to anyone else to use. And 
whoever is going to be using it, they don't necessarily know what you did in your package or module. They're not going to necessarily look at your code. They're just going to try to use it. And one thing that can happen is, well, programmers are really bad at naming variables, right? We're very lazy at naming variables. We like, uh, we like the variable x a lot. We like foo bar is very common. And actually, in chat, I see a good response. That's pretty much the answer. Um, you don't want to confuse Python of on like where this variable, where this function is coming from. And so when we have this class 8.factorial, it's basically saying, hey, it's the factorial function from this module. And the advantage of this is, for example, if I wanted to write uh, another factorial function in here, and it's also going to take in n, and uh, this factorial function is going to be a uh, iterative solution. So the other one was a recursive one version. This one's going to be an iterative with a loop. So I can say like for i in range um, n plus one, I need a result. Uh, I'm just going to multiply all the numbers. So res times equals i. So this is going to take one. Multiply it by one, multiply it by two, three, four, five, all the way up to n. And then we just return. So here I have a factorial function in this class, in this module. Let me reformat. Um, I have a factorial function here. I have a factorial function here. And now I can choose which one to call. So here, I'm going to add a print statement. So print, um, this is using a loop. And this one is using a recursion. Oh, oops. I, I didn't have the print. And so here, now if I run the file, we'll see it uh, very interesting. So we have the 120, we have the 720. Also, I think I messed up. Oh. I need one there. We can actually do two. So my code had a, a bug in it, so I fixed it. Um, and so here you can see that, first of all, the recursive function, it calls itself again and again and again. So this re print recursion is going to happen again and again and again. And I notice here for the 120, it printed it five times. For the 720, it, it prints it six times. So that's this one, class 8.factorial 6. It does the recursion six times. It prints out 720 as your answer. But I can still call this other one, this uh, iterative solution, the one that uses a loop. And you can see it prints out something slightly different. The answer is still the same, because they're both valid ways of calculating the factorial. But you notice it's using the different functions. And so the advantage of when you import a module and then have this kind of syntax is that you don't have any risk of modifying code that you've written. And the term for this is called namespacing. Um, so it's, it's one word, namespace. So namespace, I put it in chat. And this is called namespacing. You basically put everything into what's called a namespace. And the namespace in this case is class eight. And so it's just like class eight dot whatever. And the way you can think of this is you can, you're basically combining everything up, tying it all together under this name class eight. And the advantage of this is that, again, you don't have any conflicts, right? Maybe I'm importing another, maybe I'm importing 10 different modules and they all have this variable called X. Well, because of namespacing, they don't start fighting for the name X because they're all different X's. You might have a class eight X, you might have a class seven X, you might have a whatever X, right? They're all kept separate in that way. There is a way to get around it though, because you might think, well, it is nice to have this namespacing, but on the other hand, it's, it's really annoying having to type 
class eight dot factorial, class eight dot factorial, every single time I want to use it, right? We like being lazy. We like typing less if we can. And so there's ways to disable this name spacing, uh, or so to say. And the way we do that is with another option uh, when you're importing modules. So for, for now, I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to get rid of this print statement because it's not really important. I'm going to get rid of this factorial function. And because of that, I'm going to get rid of the call to it. So I'm back to kind of where I started. I only have the factorial function here. I'm also going to get rid of the print statement. Um, and I'm just importing it and using it. Right? But I'm going to show you a different way that you can import things in Python. The syntax is like this, from blank, import blank. And because Python is very nice, it's very, oh, because I don't want that autocomplete. Um, you might be able to already guess what goes in these blanks, right? So the first one is the module name. Where are you importing from? I'm importing from this module, right? So I want to import from class eight, right? Now I want to say, what am I importing? I want to import the factorial function. So now I'm done. So from class eight, import factorial. And what this does is it now kind of gets rid of that namespacing idea. Now I can call factorial directly. And in fact, I have to call it directly. I no longer do class eight that factorial. I just say factorial. And so you can see it works. And just to show, if I keep the print statement again, it's showing you it's printing out the recursion version, right? Because I have all the recursion printed out right here. And so again, this is just another way of importing things. You can see it's a little bit different in a couple different ways. One, we're importing something specific here. So from class eight, import this specific function. Right. I could also do the same thing by importing a specific variable, importing a specific class. Um, I just put the name here. The other thing that's different is how you're using the import later on. In the first version, let me just put it uh, in a comment. In this first version, it imports everything under a namespace called class eight. And to access anything, I have to say class eight dot whatever I want. Here, now I'm importing it in a different way. I'm kind of importing it directly. I'm just straight copy pasting at this point. Um, I don't have to say class A dot factorial. I can just say factorial. The problem is this can start overriding things in your code. So I believe, let me make sure it's working. So I believe it's based on order. So Python runs the files from top down. And you'll notice there's actually this yellow highlighting. This is like an actual warning. And it says, redeclared factorial defined above without usage. And so well, let me just run and show you what happens. So you can see loop 720. So at this point, I'm no longer calling the thing I imported. Right? I, I, this is, it is grayed out but it's not commented. This is actually still code that I have. I'm importing it. But the problem is I've defined a function that has the same name as the thing I imported. And it's saying that, well, maybe that's okay, but the thing that's really bad is that you did this without using the import, right? So maybe it'd be fine if I did something like this, right? So it doesn't really complain if I do something like this. I import it. I use whatever thing I imported. Then I define a new version that has the same name. And then I call factorial at six again. Now I'm using the new version, right? So here you'll see the first time it's doing the recursion version because I just imported it. I haven't defined my version yet. And so it's just going to use the one it imported. Then I define my version. And now it's overwritten what I imported. The thing I imported is kind of gone at this point. 
it doesn't exist. I can't use it anymore because I've defined my version that overrides it. And you can see now it's calling the loop version. So that's the two main ways of importing modules. Um, there is a couple more tips and tricks I want to talk about for importing. But just for now, that, that was uh, basically the basics. And I want to see if anyone has any issues getting this running on their computer or if they have any questions about what I just did, this whole from class eight import factorial thing that I did here. Any questions? Nope, from Derek. Anyone else have any questions? All right, so if that's the case, um, I'm gonna talk about a couple more ways of using this import statement um, that actually are very useful. Then I'll go on talking about packages, but we're gonna see that's a, a very easy topic after we've uh, gone through this uh, whole idea of modules. Um, so here, importing, I'm going to focus on this kind of version of importing where I'm saying from this module, import whatever, right? So the first thing I want to point out is that if I want to import multiple things, I can do that, right? So let me go back to this one uh, quickly. And I'm actually going to copy this function, the loop version into this file. So I'm going to copy this, paste it. And I can't have two functions with the same name. So I'm going to call this one factorial rec for recursive, and this one factorial iter for iterative. Right. And I have to change this. And let me just format everything nicely. So now I have two different functions. Uh, in this file. And maybe just for the heck of it, I'm going to make variable x equals 7. Right? So I have two functions, and I have a variable in this file. If I import want to import multiple things, um, all I have to do is just put multiple things here, and I separate them by commas. So I can import factorial iter and x, for example, and I separate them by commas. And now I can print x. I can maybe even print factorial iter x. Right. So if I run it, you'll see that x is 7. Or that's about, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 7 factorial is 5040. That looks right. And you can see here's I've imported multiple things. Right. And the whole point here is I can import functions, I can import variables, I can import whatever I want, really. Um, I haven't shown it, but you can import classes. And it really works the same way as everything else. Once you import a class, you can use it as if it was defined in uh, the file. However, what if you want to import everything? Right. Uh, again, if you remember the first syntax I told you, the easiest one, import class eight, it imports everything from the module. So how do we do kind of the equivalent with this syntax? If we want to import it this way using the from import statement, how do we import everything? And in Python, and uh, it's pretty shared in a lot of programming languages, the symbol for everything is the star. So we can say from class eight, import star. And the star is almost like a fill in the blank for Python. And so it's saying import anything that you can, anything and everything. So import factorial iter, import factorial recursive, import x, right? And 
you'll see that here the code works because I'm still importing x and factorial iter. But now if I add another variable here, so y equals nine, for example, let me just format it. I can also print y, right? So it automatically updates. You can see nine is here. It automatically updates for me. So whenever I make a change to this, this file, this module, by doing import star, it automatically imports everything new that I've added. So star is just a shortcut for everything. The last thing to cover uh, for this import statement, and again, it's it doesn't really give you any more power. So notice like these two versions, they kind of do the same thing. They have important differences, but in terms of like what they allow you to do, uh, there's no if your code works with the first version, I can make it work uh, with the second version as well. I'll have to make changes to, to adapt to the different ways I'm importing, but it doesn't give you access to more things. It doesn't give you access to less things. It's completely equal. And the last thing I want to talk about is, again, it doesn't give you any additional power, but it can make your life a little bit easier. So for example, um, have this function factorial recursive, and I can import it factorial recursive. But maybe I say again, I'm I'm just really lazy, right? Factorial underscore rec is such a long name, right? And I only have this one factorial function that I'm importing, and so I just want to make my life easier. I want to rename this function, right? And you can do that. The way you do it is with the as keyword. So I say from class eight, import factorial recursive. And now I say as some renamed version. So I can say as just fac, right? FAC. And now notice that it doesn't know what X is. It doesn't know what Y is because I'm no longer importing those. But I can now just say fac seven. And if I run this, you'll see that it works basically how it did before. This is a shortcut for importing something and renaming it at the same time. And it's just useful um, you'll, when you're looking online. Uh, we're going to see a couple examples of very common imports. But a very common thing that people use is this cool tool called NumPy. And this is a package. I'll very briefly talk about what packages are. But in pretty much any example that anyone writes with NumPy, they always write something like this, import NumPy as NP. And pretty much the whole reason is we don't like writing NumPy, 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 NumPy over again. But it can be useful to make it shorter and use the as syntax and to say as NP. And this basically just makes our life easier. Instead of having to write NumPy, we're going to say NP instead. It's just a, a lot less typing. Uh, I see a question, what is NumPy? Great question. NumPy, uh, literally, it's like short for number and py Python. Um, it's a package that is not built into Python, something that you have to download. But it's very, very useful in math applications, but not necessarily like pure math, but also things like if you heard of what machine learning is, um, NumPy is very big in machine learning. If you're ever doing Python for like statistics or uh, an analyzing data, NumPy is like uh, everyone uses it. Um, but you'll notice that if I try to import NumPy right now, they'll say it doesn't know what NumPy is. And that's because it's not built into Python. Um, something you might not have made the connection before, but one example um, that I've probably shown in this class um, is this import math module. So now we can kind of understand what's going on. So math.py, for example. 
So math is a module that's built into Python that has very convenient math tools for you. And this is something that we've done before, import math. This imports the module. And because we're using this syntax, we have to, it's namespaced, so we have to do math.py. But once we do that, we get access to the variables in this um, module. And so you can see it printed out the value for you. Um, one last thing before I go to packages is uh, right here. Let me import class eight again. And there's a very useful tool called dir. Uh, I call it a tool, but it's just a function. So I can do dir class eight and print it out. And dir basically is short for directory. And if you know what a directory is, it's just a way of looking up values. And specifically, it's basically looking up whatever is available in this thing that you're asking me to look up. And so here I'm looking up the class eight module essentially. And it tells me every, uh, it basically tells me everything that's in there. Um, and you'll notice there's a lot of special double underscore stuff. And I'm not getting, gonna get into that stuff, but you'll notice the factorial iter, the factorial recursive, the X and Y all show up. And the same thing happens if you do like a built-in um, module. So like import math, math is gonna have a lot more in there. So if I do this, it's gonna be probably a giant directory, the scroll bar. So you can see there's arc cosine, arc cosh, arc sine, arc cinch, arc tan, arc tan two, so on, so on. There's a whole bunch of things here. So the dir can be useful sometimes to just get an idea of what's available to you. I've imported this thing. I don't know everything that's in there, but you can use this dir and it basically just tells you everything you have access to. Uh, Mason, I see your message. Uh, I'm glad you're able to get it now. Uh, right now we're just working with PyCharm and talking about modules and packages. Um, I'm not sure the best way of catching you up. Um, I don't want you to be confused for the second half as well. So maybe really quickly, I'll go over the main points. Um, we created two Python files. And I said that Python files are the same thing as Python modules. So we have this new term modules. It's just a fancy way of saying a Python file. So whenever I say something, something module, it's the same thing as talking about a Python file. So here I've created a Python file. I've created a Python module, same thing. And I've done just normal Python stuff that we've done in the past. I've written some functions. I've created some variables, right? And this is all part of my module now. And the reason we have modules is that now we've created all this stuff in one place, and now we can use it in a lot of other places. And if, uh, again, this whole goes back to the whole naming convention. It's called a module because it's modular. If you heard of the term modular, it means it's kind of pieces that can fit together, like Legos, right? A Lego brick by itself is not very useful, but it is very easily combined with other Legos to create cool stuff. And so the whole, that idea is the same in Python. We have these modules, which by themselves, yeah, they're a little bit interesting, but they don't do too much by themselves. But you can combine a bunch of them. You can create something new that's actually really useful out of them. Um, and we talked about how to import them here. So the most basic way is just to import the module name. And the module name is just whatever's before the .py. So you can do something like that. That's really the basics. You probably will want to go over the recording uh, later. But for now, th that, that's the main points. And for everyone else, um, that's what I want you to take away from Python modules. Um, the thing I want to talk about in the last few minutes uh, really is Python packages. 
And packages, there's not really much to talk about. Uh, I think that's important that I haven't covered yet. Packages are basically just a bunch of modules grouped together. And in PyCharm, you can actually create a package yourself, but you can just say new. And one of the options right above Python file is Python package. And a Python package is basically just a folder of Python modules. You kind of interact with them the same way. You can import packages this pretty much the same way that you import modules. Uh, so I'm really not going to spend much time into it. Um, everything that I talked about with modules applies to packages. But where I do want to spend some time with packages is introducing you to the idea of Python, what makes it so great, or one of the reasons why it's so great, is that it has a lot of users. And those users have created a lot of useful packages for you to use. For example, like the NumPy package that I've been talk I talked about earlier. And there's also just like some other random packages that people have made. And when we installed Python last class, um, I mentioned there's something that came along called the called pip pip. That's short for package installer for Python. So pip package installer for Python. And it's a tool that allows you to install whatever a whole bunch of packages that other people have made. And so I want to show just a really quick demo. Um, you don't have to follow along if you don't want. Um, but what I'm going to do is kind of at the bottom, there's an option to go to terminal, this bottom left corner. And here, this is the same thing as the CMD that I showed last time. I can do pip pip install. And now I list a package name. And uh, there's one package that I found a couple of days ago that's kind of funny. It's called the PyJokes package. It's a PY for Python and jokes. So it's a, it's a package that contains a lot of jokes. And what I'm doing is I'm telling pip, hey, I want to install this package. And what happens is pip is actually connected to the internet. So you need internet connection to do this. But it basically goes on the internet and says, hey, internet, get me this package. I need to download it. And it grabs it and then brings it to your computer and kind of, it's almost like it installs it onto your computer. But really, as we've said, packages are just a collection of modules. Modules are just Python files. So it's not really installing anything. It's just downloading these Python files so that you can use them in whatever you want to make, right? So I've uh, finished installing this and now I can use it. So I can import PyJokes now. And before, if you didn't do the pip install, it wouldn't work. Um, but now I've downloaded it. I have have these access to these files now. Um, I can import it. And now I need to use it. You can look up documentation online. But the most basic way is there's a function called get jokes. So I can say print. And then since I imported it this way, import PyJokes, I need to say the name of the package, PyJokes dot and here get jokes so it's a function and i'm just gonna get a random joke and print it out and if i do evan your prediction is pretty much accurate it's very cringy programming related uh jokes um some of these aren't really funny <laughs> i'll be honest they're uh, they're uh, they appeal to a specific category of people. Um, but I don't know if, so here's one. There are only two hard problems in computer science, cache invalidation, naming things, and off by one errors. And so the joke, we, we have talked about off by one errors, I think. That's when you have like a loop that maybe goes one too far or one too little. And so the joke here is that you said two things, and now there's three things. So that's a one-off error. Yeah, it's it's. I, I didn't say it's very funny, but he, hopefully you can start getting the idea of like people have very very smart people have written very useful packages that you have very easy access to, and it's as simple as just 
downloading some files and then importing them. And all of a sudden you get access to a whole bunch of things very easily. Like this PyJokes package, yeah, it by itself might seem very simple. Like it doesn't really do anything powerful, but think if you had to write it, it would take you some time, right? Like you'd have to come up with all your jokes. You'd have to write these functions that randomly pick some. It's not necessarily quick to write, but it's very quick to just uh, download and import, right? And so it can save you a lot of time that way. I know, uh, let me check on time. It's close to four o'clock. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't understand all the jokes here either. Um, but again, this is kind of a joke package. The, the numpy one that I mentioned before is a lot more serious. It's uh, very useful. Um, it's probably the most used package that I use in my classes um, just because it, it has a lot of useful tools and uh, everyone just uses it. Um, but in the, now I want to take a moment, um, get, through, get through some logistics. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is today is the last class scheduled for Python 2. And we're not completely sure what will be offered for Python 3. Uh, I think it will depend on enrollment, but um, Python 3 will kind of start going in another direction. It's going to be, I think, involving um, using this package called Pygame to create games in Python. And if you're interested, reach out to Ms. He. I'm sure she'll provide some more information as well. Um, otherwise, I do want to take some extra time. I want to leave some time today um, to answer any last questions um, before we go for this last class. I want to make sure everyone is set up and un set up with PyCharm. And I don't want to leave anyone uh, feeling confused. So um, I have some extra time today. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be here to go over them. Uh, otherwise, there is no homework um, because today is the last class. And um, I think that's it for logistics. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> I think that's all I had. Um, can you tell them to me? Yes, yes. Uh, in the different